One of the most important things that you can know for your health is both sides of the equation. Okay, now it's easy when you look at insulin resistance to point the finger at glucose and glucose only because glucose demands a lot of insulin and eventually that can cause a problem, right? But we do have to look at the other side too. Saturated fat can also play a role in insulin resistance. In fact, it can play a very large role. And I'm not in any way, shape, or form saying that you need to not eat fats. That's not me. Okay, you know that I am a lower carb kind of guy. I'm an advocate for that. But I suggest take what you learned from this video and massage your diet accordingly, because I'm gonna give you some tips on how to change things. So it's not about just not eating saturated fats. It's about watching the kinds of saturated fats you're eating, but also maybe changing up the kinds of fats you have now and then to avoid some of these potential issues. See, there's something called lipotoxicity, and this is where you basically have lipid overload. Now this can come from excess dietary fat, excess saturated fat consumption, but also adipose tissue, having excess fat on our body. What this can lead to is what's called ectopic lipid accumulation, where you have so much fat that is circulating that you start to have it accumulating in organs where it shouldn't be accumulating, ultimately leading to insulin resistance, leading to more inflammation, and leading to this vicious cycle. So to give you an overview, inflammation is probably the biggest player here. Okay, inflammation is at the root of insulin resistance in so many ways. Now, at a molecular basis, you can look at insulin resistance in different organs, and there's all kinds of different things. There are all kinds of different causes for insulin resistance at different organ levels. But when you come back down to it, excess nutrient intake, whether it's excess glucose, excess fat, excess calories in general, that is an inflammatory situation. And that inflammatory situation inhibits insulin from really doing its job properly, okay? The inflammation makes everything fuzzy. So the insulin cannot send the right signals and it cannot connect to the brain. So there's many different methods and reasons for insulin resistance, but many of them circle right back to inflammation. And I know what you're thinking here. Before Thomas starts bagging on saturated fats, well, isn't a lower carb diet relatively anti-inflammatory? Yes, it is, and that's something that I wanna point out. If you're on a lower carb ketogenic diet, then yeah, you have sort of an anti-inflammatory benefit that comes from what's called the inhibition of nuclear factor kappa B. Okay, but that does not absolve you of your duties to modulate your intake, right? You cannot, just because you're producing ketones doesn't mean you can eat 10,000 calories of cheese and not have an inflammatory response. So there's a guy named Roger Unger that really coined the term lipotoxicity. And what he found is that when there was lipid overload, too much fat coming in at one time, pancreatic islets would actually end up not functioning right and it would inhibit the pancreatic beta cells from producing insulin. So too much fat at one time actually stopped the pancreas from doing its job when it came down to producing insulin. This is really important for people on a lower carb protocol because a lot of us, like myself, I was trying to help my prediabetes. I was trying to help my insulin resistance and it did help immensely but some people load up so much on the saturated fat that maybe they're doing themselves a disservice by having excess lipids that are negatively affecting the pancreatic beta cells. Now what we found is that excessive lipids can affect other cells too. So this lipotoxicity thing started with the pancreas and now we started saying, wait a minute, this is happening in other cells and other organs too. The first thing we have to look at is the hypothalamus, the brain, because this is the epicenter of a lot of this. And when inflammation is rearing its ugly head, the hypothalamus gets affected. Remember, one of the key jobs of the hypothalamus is to match our energy intake with our expenditure. Now, it can't physically make us go out and run to expend energy when we eat, but what it can do is it can regulate our appetite to prevent excess energy intake, right? So, for example, if we are not eating enough, our hypothalamus can send a signal to make us hungry. If we are overeating, our hypothalamus will send a signal to send different hormones to stop us from eating so much, to make us either more hungry or make us satiated. Well, one of the things that's been noted in research is that excess nutrients, namely excess palmitic acid, which is a kind of saturated fat, can actually trigger inflammation within the hypothalamus affecting our satiety. Okay, so it comes right back to that inflammation again. But on the other side of this, and here's your first hot tip, there is something called the GPR120 binding protein that is also on the hypothalamus. This GPR120 binding protein receives omega-3s. 
like EPA and especially DHA in the brain. And guess what that does? That actually does the opposite. That reduces inflammation within the hypothalamus. That allows these signals to work again. So the kinds of fats matter. So I'm not here saying fats are bad. I'm saying we need to make sure that we are getting enough of the right kinds of fats. And if you're doing a lower carb protocol and just having a bunch of saturated fats, namely palmitic acid, you could be still causing localized inflammation within the hypothalamus. Whereas you might want to counteract that with some omega-3s. And the meats that you do eat, you probably want to eat meats that are more leaning towards grass-fed, grass-finished, so they have more in the way of the omega-3s. And meats that are a little bit leaner. So if you're going for a cut of steak, maybe you go for one like a New York versus a ribeye. So you're getting a little less of the palmitic and you're getting a little bit more of the well-rounded fats. And then maybe you're cooking it with a little bit of avocado oil or something like that to kind of round out, get those oleic acids, which we'll talk about in a minute as well. I put a link down below for ButcherBox. If you're having a hard time finding grass-fed, grass-finished beef, they are my go-to for that. So that link down below is for ButcherBox. So you go there, you select whatever cuts of meat you want, like New York's, they do have ribeyes if you want to go that route, but they also have the leaner steaks, like the fillets and things like that. I'm a big fan of skirt steak too, making fajitas, things like that. So that link is down below. Everything is delivered right to your doorstep. So super easy, very, very convenient. And then you can also make it so you just get it on the monthly. So I don't end up having to buy steaks from the grocery store anymore, especially now that we're starting to see a little bit more in the way of supply chain issues. Like when I go to the grocery store, a lot of times the steaks are expiring in like two days, which is not exactly what I can have happening. I mean, I can put them in the freezer, but anyway, ButcherBox makes it super easy. So I put that link down below. They've been a sponsor on this channel for half a decade. They are awesome and I trust them thoroughly. That's why they've been on this channel for five plus years. So that link is down below to check them out. What's interesting, and this isn't meant to scare you, it's meant to give you positive advice that you're gonna take out of this in a second after you get scared. In particular studies, when they gave rodents a high fat diet, and they put them on a high fat diet, within just 24 hours, they saw massive increases in inflammation. They saw the IKK response leading to more nuclear factor kappa B, leading to ultimately inflammation, leading to insulin resistance. But what's interesting is when you flip that on its head, short-term caloric restriction, have the opposite effect. So even though a high fat diet, namely palmitic acid, okay, the saturated fat we don't necessarily want a lot of, when you have that, yeah, you have an inhibition of the leptin and the insulin signaling within the hypothalamus. But if you turn it the other way and you put them in a deficit for 24 hours, then that gets kind of reversed. So my point in saying this isn't that you need to constantly go back and forth, but you may wanna consider fasting every other day or fasting a couple of times a week and put yourself in a serious deficit and let your fasting days be a deficit because this could be very beneficial. If you're doing a lower carb protocol or you're someone that just likes to eat a lot of saturated fat, then you probably do need to try to turn the knob the other direction. It's one more reason to say, hey, this is why you might wanna consider fasting alongside a higher fat intake. It's a reason that nobody's really talking about. What's interesting is just like I mentioned that GPR120 binding protein, well, there's actually something that does sort of the opposite too. Okay, CD36, which is a fatty acid transporter, it senses fat. Now when CD36 in the brain senses palmitic acid, okay? Now palmitic acid is a saturated fat that is formed in our body from excess glucose too. Okay, so that's probably the reason why, but I don't wanna go down that rabbit hole. So when the blood-brain barrier senses excess fat, excess palmitic acid, it triggers the hypothalamus to send a signal to the adrenals to release more cortisol, therefore increasing insulin resistance. You hear what I'm saying? When there is too much fat in the bloodstream and it hits the brain, it triggers a release of cortisol, which can lead to insulin resistance. But here's another good thing. The opposite happens with oleic acid, okay? So just like CD36 can see the bad fats, they can also see good fats. So oleic acid, like you're gonna get from olive oil, like you're gonna get from avocado oil, or eating olives or just eating avocados. Well, guess what? The brain senses those, and it does the opposite effect. Okay, so it is about the kinds of fats that we eat. And again, I hate to throw the saturated fat under the bus because it's so beloved in the lower carb community, and it doesn't mean you don't eat it, but the goal here is maybe 20% of your fat calories coming from saturated fat. That's all I'm asking. I'm not asking you to cut it out. I'm just saying, hey, try adding other fats in or periodically go lower fat just to kind of switch it up and give your body a break. 
But when we get really granular and we really understand the biochemistry here, we understand that adipose tissue is where a lot of this problem starts. That's why we see obese people having such higher instances of insulin resistance, because a lot of it does start in the adipose tissue. So this is exceptionally important for people that are a little bit overweight that are doing a lower carb protocol and eating a lot of saturated fat. It's very important for them to be aware of this because what happens is a fat cell can only grow so much. It can only expand so much. And once it reaches a certain point of expansion, it starts kind of leaking fats, leaks fatty acids out of it. And when this happens, it creates this like hypoxic environment. Okay, it triggers hypoxia, so a lack of oxygen. And this triggers a specific gene called HIF-1. This HIF-1 then triggers more inflammation. Okay, so now you have like an inflammatory response that is literally being created by the presence of adipose tissue and adipose tissue that's trying to grow more and more. Now, normally in a healthy individual, insulin would actually stop fat from leaking fat into the bloodstream. So go envision like a house full of lots of little free fatty acids. Well, normally insulin actually stops those little fatty acids from getting into the bloodstream. But remember that our cells are insulin resistant. So if our fat cells are insulin resistant, then the insulin doesn't affect the fat cell anymore. And the fat cell leaks all these fatty acids into the bloodstream. And then what do they do? Well, they shouldn't be there. So we are now in a situation of lipotoxicity. We have too much fat, excess fat, triggering all these hormonal cascades. But now these fats are circulating through the bloodstream and guess what they're doing? They're going to other organs and causing issues with those organs. For example, they go into the liver. That's why it's so interesting when you look at type two diabetics, 90% of the obese type two diabetics have a fatty liver. Does it make sense? They're insulin resistant, so their fat is able to leave the cell easy. So it goes through the bloodstream, circulates through the bloodstream, and then goes to the liver. And guess what? The liver likes to store fat from these kinds of fats. It's actually easier for the liver to gain and accumulate fat from free fatty acids than it is from de novo lipogenesis from excess carbohydrates. Don't get me wrong, excess carbohydrates can absolutely contribute to a fatty liver but it seems as though saturated fat might be actually an even bigger driver of a fatty liver if it's in excess. So once the liver becomes sort of insulin resistant, it has the inability to deal, so it just starts storing fat. So you can see how it all circulates. It, it may sound like I am this anti-saturated fat guy. I mean, I'll let you know that I had cheese on my omelet this morning, right? I'm not afraid of saturated fat but I'm not a fan of sitting down and eating 90% of my fat from saturated fat because the research is still out there. So even though we have to look at it with both sides, we really can still know that, okay, what I'm doing is okay. I just need to take periodic breaks. So here's your takeaways just so you have them. Okay. Olive oil, avocado oil, as much as you can, because that's going to keep that sense alive in the hypothalamus. It's going to attenuate that inflammatory response a little bit more. Okay. That is a really big one. Omega threes alongside saturated fats. So grass fed, grass finished meats, or eat a high fish diet that has high amounts of omega threes that can act upon that receptor in the brain that kind of modulates that inflammatory response. Occasional fasting or fasting after surplus days, if you need to kind of balance things out, just sort of reverse that effect in terms of the brain. Because remember, just 24 hours of a high fat diet in a rodent triggered this inflammatory response. Okay, but reversing that can reverse that response. So being able to do that is really good. And lastly, less than 20% of your total fat should be saturated fat in a given day, unless you're willing to offset it with some additional activity or something like that. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel. See you tomorrow.